The Word of God says that when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will help us. He will lead us and guide us. He will not speak on His own authority, but whatever He hears from the Father, He will speak. And He will tell us things to come. It's the Holy Spirit. And I just want to say that because the Spirit told me to. He was <laughs> guiding me to say that. I want to do a, uh, best I can, a follow-up to last week's message. I didn't foresee a part two, but it came to me right on the heels of the last message. If you recall, I showed you this map. It's a picture of the Near East in the first century when the Romans were in governance, when they were in charge of the largest empire at the time. And the marker you see in the center is where Jerusalem is. And Jesus told the disciples, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Last week, I quoted from Origen, and it could be quoted from other early church fathers, how impurities had seeped into the church, immoralities had seeped into the church, and they had acted to quench the spirit and the very thing that God was trying to stir, the very thing that God wants to happen, his kingdom come, his will be done here on earth, in that time started to falter, not because of any fault of his, because of our earthly vulnerabilities to immorality. That is, if you will, one side of the ditch, of the narrow path of walking in the Spirit. By his grace, we are able to do so. The narrow path that Jesus says to enter by the narrow gate and follow that narrow path. That is, as if, if you will, a, a one side of the ditch. And I, if you'd allow me, I'd like to point out today in this message another side of the ditch. We read through 1 Corinthians 5 and various other scriptures last week, and we saw that it is appropriate in the truth of the Spirit to correct those who call themselves children of God, brothers and sisters, and are specifically dealing with sexual immorality. We also read about extortion, malice, and wickedness. It is correct. It is a standard. It's a holy standard by the Holy Spirit to uphold. But there's this ditch that we can get in. We can get in a rut. We can get rigid. We can get ritualistic. When we start looking at the behaviors alone and forget about the person. When we start saying, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, and not realizing that the love of God is being pushed down and suppressed and replaced with ritual and rules and regulations. In the early church, Irenaeus, Montanus, and others had this observation, the freedom of the Spirit was being replaced by ceremonial ritual and ecclesiastical order. There is this tendency for us to go pleasure, to go hedonistic. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It's not of the Father, John says. It's of the world. And the world is passing away in the lust of it. There's this tendency, even though we read that as Christians, for us to go that way. There's an equal, if not more compelling, tendency for us to go to the other side of the ditch and start making rules and regulations about things and letting behavior drive us and not the love of God. For those that may not be familiar, this is a graphic that is a picture of the vision of this house. 
and in talking with many other ministers in this region, they have similar visions. It's just not expressed in this specific graphic. They have great ways of saying things, my colleagues, if you will, other lead pastors. But let me just explain this very quickly. That red marker in the center is where ACF is, Airport Christian Fellowship. And we're called by the Lord, prophetically confirmed over and over again, to influence a region, a radius around our church, with this church as the epicenter, a radius of 75 miles into Canada, down as far south as Syracuse, as far east as the Adirondacks, and as far west as Lake Ontario. Bless our fishermen in Jesus' name. We're called to be witnesses by the power of the Holy Spirit in this immediate region and beyond. And it's supposed to be a resounding influence throughout the world. It's not just this church, it's every church. Every church has an epicenter, every church that is in Jesus. If they're in Jesus, they're in love and they're in the Spirit. The Spirit leading and guiding. The Spirit of God without whom we can do nothing. We're in a series entitled Love Like Jesus. And I just want to share with you six portions of Scripture. This is not an exhaustive list, but just to bring home the point that Jesus was doing things that broke the rules and the conventions of modern day culture in his day. The contemporary rules and wisdom would have him, when someone wants to make him a king in John chapter 6, would have him saying, okay, because they were believing he was the Messiah. The expectation on him was that he would step forward in a public way. No, he departs to a mountain by himself alone. Much to the consternation of all who are saying, he's a king, he's a king. The Pharisees and the religious leaders come up to him and they say, they come up to the disciples and they say of Jesus, he's hanging out with tax collectors and sinners. He's hanging out with the the vermin. How, How can this be? Jesus in his perfect love defies the defies the conventional wisdom. Those who are well have no need of a physician, he said. But those who are sick, the Pharisees and the Herodians come up to him, trying to entangle him, trying to trap him. Are you going to pay taxes? Jesus responds, much to the chagrin of Simon the Zealot, who comes from a background of hate the Romans, don't pay taxes, and he's zealous for it. This is one of Jesus' inner circle. Jesus says, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Jesus, the disciples come to him with the full expectation, trying to push him into a mold of what they expect. There's a man over here who's not following us, who's not with us physically, but he's casting out demons in your name. Should we rebuke him? Jesus says, do not forbid him, for he who is not against us is on our side. In other words, he is not our enemy. Broaden the horizon. There's more ways that I want to move, and the Holy Spirit wants to move, than Josh Gemitter. Put your own name in the first person. Then we can conceptualize. There's two times in the scripture where Jesus is described as receiving a washing of the feet from a woman. It's described as Mary in one sense, but in this other sense, in this other situation, it's described as a sinner, and I believe it's a separate person. Many theologians believe it's a prostitute. She's literally broken her alabaster flask, poured out precious fragrant oil, spikenard over his feet. Her tears are just pouring out and she's washing him and kissing his feet. The disciples are upset about this. Didn't didn't Jesus just say that I've come to heal 
those who have come to be a physician for the sick, and here they are again dealing with it, this expectation. He says, no, 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 don't stop her. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. Can you picture that? There's a certain cultural discomfort with that, with with the sensuality that might be involved with that, the intimacy that might be involved with that. And Jesus is saying, don't stop it. Don't let your expectations of what's holy and what's right, don't let the rules stop and block the love of my heart being flooded into this woman. They want to make him a king, his disciples do. In John 10, Jesus defies their expectations. He tells him he's going to die. And furthermore, he says, no one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of myself. Wait, you're going to die? And you're going to do it because you want to? This is the plan? They still didn't get it. He prophesies the night before his crucifixion. He prophesies you'll be scattered, and they are scattered. God help us get it. In Jesus' name. I want to talk briefly about this city called Ephesus. Ephesus is the site of major commercial trading, major cultural mecca. They've got a goddess there named Diana, whom they worship among other gods and practicing all kinds of pagan witchcraft. They've actually seen some real supernatural things happen in the demonic realm. This is a church that Paul is credited as founded, but if we read in Scripture, it's Apollos who started it. Apollos planted and Paul watered. Paul planted in other places and Apollos planted and Apollos watered in other places. That'll mean something for some, but not for everybody. This is the site of whom John the church that John is speaking to in Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. And we're going to read that right now. This is a church, when John writes this, it's a few years after Paul has written to Ephesus. It's maybe 10 years or so after the church has been founded. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, The angel is a metaphor for a pastoral oversight bishop or presbyter. He's talking to the seven churches, and there's seven pastors or bishops over them. These things, says he who holds the seven stars, also referring to pastors, another metaphor. In his right hand, John is writing as Jesus himself is speaking to him, and this is Jesus who holds the seven stars who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, another metaphor that's largely accepted for the churches. Seven pastors, seven churches, Jesus is speaking to them. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. Good job, Jesus is saying. And you have tested those who say they are apost- who are apostles and are not. And have found them liars correctly. Good job discerning, church. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my namesake and have not become weary. This is a very high commendation. Sadly, there are churches today, sadly in our history, blindly, there's been, I'll speak for myself, there's been times where I would have rested in this commendation and forgotten about what he says next. Remember, therefore, he says, nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. That word left comes from the Greek word epiphany, which can be tra- translated divorced. It's, it's not just losing sight of or, or even the, the passivity of neglect. It's an intentional walking away. It's an intentional placing rules, ceremonies, 
the, the regulations of what Jesus put in order, putting that first. It's as if they're making good behavior their Messiah. Let he who has ears to hear, and she to hear, mine included, let us who have eyes to see, see the different ways that we have actually divorced our first love. Tough language, Josh. Not with condemnation. It's not. In Christ, there's conviction. The Holy Spirit who convicts of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. The sin of idolatry. The sin of pride. And trying to take this thing called the church or maybe we can just take it right home, this thing called my Christian walk, trying to take it in my own hands and make things happen. Set up rules and systems and regulations that all jettison and act to push away the loving Messiah himself. There's a way that Isaiah speaks to this in Isaiah 55, verses eight and nine. He says, My ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways higher than yours and my thoughts than your thoughts. As best as we think we understand the problem we're facing, as best as we think we understand the scripture, those of us that are teachers and preachers, as best as we think we understand our spouses, as best as we understand anything in this earth, It all pales in comparison to his thoughts higher than ours, his ways higher than ours. It says it in three times in the scripture, twice quoting from Proverbs 3. He resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Oh, that we would be humble. The grace of God making it possible for us. I just want to bless those of us that have felt guilty lately and have surrendered that guilt to the Lord. You may, in fact, be in a more humble state. (laughs) If any of us think we're okay, (laughs) we're we're just all that. Oh, I don't, I wouldn't say that. No, I know I'm a sinner. But it doesn't show in the actions and the way that you look at other people. Just Receive the Holy Spirit's spoken word, the rhema, his individual impression upon your heart. It's an intimate, intimate influence that he speaks and he shows and he reveals, wow, that's not of me, God. That's not of me, Josh. It's of of you. Those times, not every time, I'll be honest, but those times I've fasted and said, this is how I'm going to get close to the Lord. Those times that I've prayed for long times, This is how I'm going to get praise. Those of us that are believing for revival, (laughs) there's no revival that happens, including the first one in the first century, without prayer. But sometimes we get into the mode where prayer earns the revival. And we jettison and we divorce the first love. That word first comes from the Greek word protos. It means the essence from which everything is built from. The love of Jesus, if it is not in our hearts, we're denying God himself. The beloved disciple himself, John, in the fourth chapter of his first epistle, he says, God is love. Yet we're replacing our loving Messiah with good behavior if we're not careful. Remember where you have fallen. Repent and do the first works or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand. In other words, I'll just raise, R-A-Z-E, level your church, unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Differences of perspective of what the Nicolaitans actually were, but a universal understanding that they were those that gave in to fleshly indulgence. Good job, Ephesus. You stood up against sexual immorality. 
You stood up against all the pleasures of this world. But repent, you've left your first love. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I want to show you a picture. <laughs> Becky and I remember that. We were 16 and this was budding first love. When I find out, found out that she actually liked me, and that's terminology for I'm interested in you, I, I, I could be your, if you wanted to maybe, you know, we could have something more than just friendship, you know. When I first found out, I came home. <laughs> I don't know what possessed me. I don't think it was the Spirit of God. I got up on my kitchen table. It's a bench. It might have been the table itself. I don't remember. I was feeling pretty good. And I just leaped off in the air and what did I say? I love women. I love women. <laughs> <laughs> it's, there's just something about that first love experience. It's supposed to, it's supposed to stay with us. This is a picture of us when we were engaged just before we got married. I know what you're thinking. What did he do to land a woman like that? <laughs> it's true. It's true. There's something in our hearts that God wants to do. He wants to stir in us a recollection. Deeper than that, he wants to put in us a perpetual longing, a passion for him. Think back. When you first became a Christian, those of us that are sons and daughters of God, if you're not a Christian yet, if you're not a follower of Jesus, you can become one. It's his love that melts our hearts. But think about it. When we first came to believe in Jesus, the different times throughout our walk that he refreshed and reignited that love. Rekindled the romance, if you will. Before all the busyness took over, before all the rules and regulations and the heaviness of the cares of this world came upon us, if we're honest, before we took them up. This is something that's happened throughout church history. In the first great awakening, there was a guy named George Whitfield who was friends with Ben Franklin. And George was pushed out of church after church after church because of rules and ceremonial ritual. He found himself in a field, and then a field after that, and many fields, speaking to tens and twenties and 30,000 people at, at once. And he would cry because of the love of God in his heart being poured out. So much so he would cry in the tenderness and the presence of the Lord and his love for Jesus and his love for people that they would comment, who, what is he doing? That's not right. And in their stodginess and in their snobbery, they'd push him away. But that didn't stop the love of God. Benjamin Franklin says of this, says this of his friend, George was at first permitted to preach in some of our churches, but the clergy, taking a dislike to him, soon refused him their pulpits, and he was obliged to preach in the fields. Perhaps the most prominent name in the first Great Awakening. Great Awakening. If I could, in the context of this message, just suggest to you a parallel term, a rekindling of the first love. Jonathan Edwards was open to the move of the Holy Spirit to a certain extent. His wife, Sarah, was overcome by the Holy Spirit many times over, and he encouraged her to write of her testimonies and experiences in the Spirit of God. She would be swooned, she would come out, she would fall out in the Spirit. Thousands of people coming to the Lord, denominations coming together, 
one day one man came up to Jonathan and said, I believe we're supposed to release the prophetic gifts, the gifts of healings and the gifts of tongues. And Jonathan, as ignorant as you and I could be sometimes, said, no, those gifts have ceased. It's not the case. It's not the case. There is a line, a continuous line, throughout the, since the first century till now of the Holy Spirit moving in mighty ways and charismatic gifts. Jonathan writes in his personal self-reflective writings, the Spirit of God, not long after this time, not long after the quenching of the Spirit, appeared very sensibly withdrawing from all parts of the country. The first church was called to influence just as Jesus commissioned it to. Immorality, religious ritual, act, acted to deaden that resounding influence the church was supposed to have. There's another guy named Montanus, and those who follow him were called Montanists. And they believed in the gifts of the Spirit. This is the latter half of the second century, how quickly the Spirit is quelled, how quickly things get quenched when we're not in the love of God. Montanism sought to bring revival to a rapidly hardening ecclesiasticism. The church hardening, not even realizing that it was choking out the love of God that is so vital. Paul, a few years after he helps the founding of the church in Ephesus, he says, be kind to one another. He's writing to this church. He's exhorting them before the hardness has come that's spoken of in Revelation. Doesn't take too long after this, but he's exhorting them. And this inspired scripture is exhorting us. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God and Christ forgave you. Be imitators of God as dear children. And I love verse 2 of chapter 5. Walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us in offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. This is a recent picture of my wife and I. This was after an event which she uh, facilitated, one of our school supply giveaways. And if you didn't know, she has a supernatural anointing and gift to serve others. One of my servant, or one of my supernatural gifts is administration. It's in the scripture. I'm not the greatest administrator. I'm not saying that, but it is, there's things that just happen as I just bumble along in my walk. and Things get administratively organized. At one point, actually many points in our life together, my administrative gift bumped up against her service gift. You're not seeing it the way I'm seeing it, I would say to her. And she, as velvet-covered steel, would say to me, you're not seeing it the way I am, honey. <laughs> we got to a place. It came to a head. And it wasn't just calm talk. True confessions. There was raised voices, mine probably more than hers. But we got to a place where what really mattered had to come to the center. What really mattered is that he loves us. God's love in our hearts. Therefore, because I am loved, I am able to love her and love others. The centrality of the love of Jesus. It's a vital it is a first love. We can get caught up in the behavior, in my case, of servitude. She can get put off by the behavior of administration, not caring a lick for those that need to be served, or at least that's what it appears like. But we can trade the loving deliverer, the one who wants to deliver us from the things that so easily beset us. We can, we can trade our deliverer for things like behavior. It gets replaced, the first love of our deliverer. 
gets replaced and caught up. I like this picture because it's genuine. If you would, stand to your feet. We were a church not too many years ago, and we had a life group system that had gotten pretty heavy in ruling, rules, pretty heavy in ritual. We didn't mean it to, but it got heavy in rules. We're a church now by the grace of God that is seeing our life groups just flourish and proliferate. Seems like every week someone's coming forward. I have this idea, I have this idea, and life is flowing because the love of God cares about what every member brings to the table. What every member brings to the Lord's table. Paul says, from Christ, the whole body is joined together. From Christ. And every member doing its share, his and her share, causes growth for the body in love. Jesus, we thank you for your body broken for us. We thank you for your blood spilled for us. And right now, we just give you the space to speak to our hearts if there's anything that you're calling us to repent of. We called the church at Ephesus to repent of leaving the first love. If that's us, we right now will just give you the space to convict our hearts. We thank you, Jesus, that you loved us first. Holy Spirit, I bless all the ways you want to empower that truth in your living word. You loved us first. Let your love flow into hearts as we commune together. Let your love well up inside of us. Let it be a revelation. Open up our eyes to your love, Lord. Those things that are bothering us are just a trigger, a a red flag of a lack of receiving your love that covers every situation, washes over every situation, brings peace and brings hope. You loved us first by breaking your body, Lord. And right now, we partake in thanks and gratitude of your body broken. One of the things that we charismatics, at least in my experience, have gotten quote-unquote hardened about is communion. It's just a symbol And we would look at our, for instance, our Presbyterian brothers and sisters and say, well, they're so stiff and stodgy. (laughs) We could. It's been done. But I'll tell you one thing. Powerful, powerful understanding that the Presbyterian church, at least in traditional orthodoxy, understands. They call this communion as encountering Jesus in an unknown way. It's a very humble way of saying this is not just a symbol. There's great mystery with it and there's great intimacy with Jesus in it. So I just bless us to left, let, leave that understanding behind to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit in the ways that we are so blessed to enter into this new covenant. That's what Jesus says. This is the new covenant of my blood. 
as you partake in remembrance of me, you're affirming that covenant. It's a marvelous, marvelous, loving thing, saints of God. It often brings me to tears. It did last night. It's not right now, but I'm just feeling the presence of the Lord. Lord, we thank you for your condescension. We thank you that we did not deserve any of this covenant. But in your lavish grace, you allow us to enter into freedom, to be completely delivered, to be saved, to be made righteous, to have the hope and assurance of eternal life with you, to walk in the revelation, in partnership, in intimacy, in harmony, in in oneness with Holy Spirit because of this covenant. We thank you, Lord, that as we partake, we're partaking of a great, great mystery. You're actually here present, and we're affirming that covenant and all the power of that covenant. It's a new covenant, saints of God. I bless your newness, Lord to fill our hearts as we partake. Thank you, Jesus.